Hello and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to introduce to you now. Dr. Nicholas Norwitz is a new shining star in nutrition science. This 25-year-old Ivy Lead Valedictorian obtained his PhD at Oxford University in just two years, wow, and is now pursuing his MD at Harvard Medical School. His research expertise is ketosis and the aging of the brain. However, he has also published scientific papers on topics ranging from neuroscience to heart disease, gastrointestinal health to genetics, and bone health to diabetes. He is the co-author of the book, The New Mediterranean Cookbook, packed with 100 delicious looking recipes and fun facts in food science. You can find the book on his site, newmediketo.com. He's also very active on Twitter, at Nick Norwitz. Today, we'll be focusing on a recent article published on STAT, which is a site focused on the life sciences and nutrition science. Dr. Nick Norwitz, welcome to the show. Um, well, well, thank you for having me, Casey. I'm, I'm super excited to be talking with you. That was, um, I, I hope people don't think this will be a sales pitch for my book because I think what we're gonna talk about is a little bit of, uh, you know, the background of the story. I'm not gonna nerd out here about science. You can find me doing that other places. <laughs> but. Um, I was just, you know, listening to some of your content, and am so honored to 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 be here, following some really inspirational people. Even, um, uh, you know, it's such a coincidence I'm following uh, Dave McGilbrey. I actually can't believe that that uh, uh, I have a connection to him. I think that's we were talking offline. Maybe we were going to start. But Absolutely. I'm super excited to be here and and talk about how you know how my interests developed rather than ex exactly what they are. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, yeah, that's exactly where I wanted to start. It, we understand that you actually lived on the course and you actually finished the race and were greeted by Dave McGillivray, which, yes, I totally agree. Like, so funny, just the way the recording worked, we recorded a few weeks ago. It was released on April 19th, the third Monday of the month. And now we're talking to you and all the connections you have with that just mythical race. I'm so excited to learn about your story. Tell, tell us a little bit about what Boston means to you and what, why that marathon is so special for you. Yeah, well, I grew up like right at the base of Heartbreak Hill. So if you know anything about marathons, one thing you know is Boston is a legendary marathon. Until COVID, uh, until the pandemic, it was like the longest a running continuous marathon. It's one of the world's major marathons. And it's the kind of marathon that, you know, if you're a runner, you aspire to, to run. It's something that everyone around the world comes to. It's also the pride of uh, Boston in terms of athletic events. Um, and I grew up right at the base of the course. So it was always the number one athletic event. You know, I'm not a big spectator sports person, but, but this one, like, you know, everybody, living even remotely near the course got fired up like people you know dozens of people deep along 26.2 miles like that's the atmosphere wow and for me being exposed to that basically from uh, i moved to a house um at the the corner of com ave in washington so the base of heartbreak hill when i was two years old um and spent most of my childhood there and so that was always a really really special day for me and, um, and starting around age five, I just, you know, that's, that's when my, my verbal memory started. And I remember each year sitting there and waiting and waiting in anticipation for those top runners to come around the bend, that top pack, watching them like just glide so elegantly. And every year I would, um, like basically get lined up at the base of the hill. So they had already run like 17 miles and then see how far I could run alongside them up the, up the hill. And <laughs> inevitably, like, not at all. I mean, these these guys are phenomenal. They're running 26.2 miles at sub five minute paces. They're wow. crazy. But wow. it was so inspiring for me. I, I always loved it. And every year, I get a little bit further, a little bit further. And I had this dream uh, for my entire childhood of actually running the race. Now, the thing about the Boston Marathon is it's a major marathon. So you can't actually officially run it until you're 18 years old as a rule. Um, and so I always had this goal in mind. I really want to run Boston, you know, as soon as I can, when I turn 18. So my senior year of high school, um, which would mean because I, I wasn't going to be on a team qualifying. So, you know, to time qualify is pretty tough. And if you're in the basically the hardest age bracket to qualify in terms of just absolute time is 18 to 35. Mm. So I'm, you know, in that pack of, uh, qualifying times, that is the most rigorous. I think 
uh, three, three hours, five minutes was the qualifying time. Um, and so in order to qualify for that next, you know, when, when I was going to be 18, I actually had to run when I was 17, um, a, a qualifier. So I did that, um, parallel to Dave's first marathon story. That's right. I won't go into my, my, my story, but I was actually sick. Um, wow. <laughs> for that qualifier, it was Providence. And, um, <laughs> I had a really bad GI bug. I couldn't eat for like a whole day. Wow. Um, I, I won't get into the graphic details of that one, but I did qualify. And so I was really, really pumped to, um, run the Boston marathon, especially also because keep in mind, so this was 2014. So I've been building up thinking about this race for over a decade, like basically my entire life in, in terms of youth, my entire memory. Um, and, and, anticipating it the next year um was compounded by the fact that the previous year were the terrorist bombs yep on the finish line which for you know the city and, and for me was really traumatizing i remember exactly where i was when they happened i was actually studying for the sats wow uh, um with my and, and with my head in a book and i saw the news and i just i didn't even know how to register it it's like one of those things for me i, I hope this isn't you know offensive to any people hyperbolic but it's like it felt like 9-11 it's like i don't even know how to react wow like this is so weird so close to and home so, it, it literally close to home <laughs> <laughs> um and so you know that was that was rough um but that and then just thinking about the race my entire childhood i really wanted to run so um i you know I trained my butt off for that race. I mean, to qualify is, is not easy. When I was you know, 17 years old, I was running my marathons in sub three hours. So wow. I was working pretty hard. I was running the race. I wanted to know the course. Like I wanted to, you know, impress and be there with the top runners as long as I could. And I was just pumped about it. Um, and then something happened that really sucked for me, which was I got a uh, fracture. I was on Heartbreak Hill. I remember I was coming back from a long run about 17 miles into it. And I felt the sharp pain in my tibia, my right tibia. Um, there was a crack in it from just training. Uh, at least I thought it was from just training. So I had a pretty severe stress fracture and this was a couple of weeks out from the race. So I probably wasn't going to run it. Um, or actually, you know, I, I physically couldn't run it. My leg would have shattered it. Wow. But, um, the mentality of that race, it's like, once you decide to do it, like I was going to finish that race if I had to be, you know, pulling a, what is it? I don't know if you've seen like the third Star Wars where Anakin has had like his legs and arm chopped off yeah. and he's like, oh, like as one hand, he's like yeah. pulling like, if that is me, I am finishing that race that way. Wow. So um, this is actually when I, I reached out to the race directors um, and Dave. Because I'm like, listen, I really want to do this. I realize there's certain things I can't do. Like I'm not actually disabled, so I can't be in a wheelchair. Can I, can I bring crutches onto the race <laughs> and do it? And I had a clearance for this because after the bombings, they wouldn't let you take anything above a certain size. I forget what the dimensions were onto the course. So I had to get clearance to bring the crutches on. And um, as Dave, I think said in his last podcast, when it was, it was a, who was asking him, there was like a, a little woman asking him about like, you know, can I run the race? I have this disability or can I do my marathon? And he's like, ask me a hard question. Like he just wants to <laughs> enable people, give people the chance as he, he talked about that in his story. Yeah. Like, just give me a chance. And that's what I asked him basically. Like, can I just have a chance? I know this is kind of insane, please. Um, and I said the same thing to my parents because my mom was, uh, <laughs> my mom was originally initially like, um, Maybe because I don't, she's never run a marathon. She didn't really have a conception of what doing 26.2 mi 26 miles on like crutches actually is. And then after I did it, all our friends were like, what the hell? Like, how are you letting your son do this? You like horrible. <laughs> like, then she got very worried, but, um, I, you know, I made the same point to her and, and then she let me do it. Uh, and Dave gave me the clearance. So yeah, that, that's effectively what I did. I remember that day, every single moment of it. Um, from being picked up and being shipped out in buses, sitting with everybody getting weird looks on the buses, being like, why does he have crutches? And why is his leg like bandaged up? Like, this is odd. Wow. And then that look continuing um, like at the, at the start line because they wouldn't let me reshuffle. I'm like, why am I still being put in the, like, the front wave? I know my, like they, they, they set you up based on your, your time, which put me near the front. 
evidently I wasn't going to run that fast. So now I'm like stuck between a bunch of like really fast runners, awkwardly like blocking them. Yeah, I was going to ask and, about that uh, actually. Yeah, they, they they left me there in the front. Wow. Just because that was uh, protocol. So it was funny when we started. Uh, they just blasted off in front of me, obviously. Um, but but that was pretty cool because I was still in the first wave, and they that that year where there were thirty seven thousand runners because they um, increased the number following the bombings, and so being in the first wave, the first runners went off, but then everybody was still out and about, and I had some uh, a head start on the next wave. So there's a point in time when I'm crutching along, and it's literally just me surrounded by thousands and thousands of people who are like, oh, we saw the first wave go by, we're waiting for the second wave. It's like, what is that kid doing? <laughs> and that was pretty cool. <laughs> that was that was really cool for me. And um, and yeah, I was pumped at the beginning. I was like trekking along, probably going like a good five miles per hour. I was Wow. Wow. I was, um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm somebody with, I'm a little bit odd as a runner. I have a lot of upper body strength. Um, we can talk about a previous athletic accomplishment that I had early in high school, but like, I have a lot of upper body endurance. So I had a sense I could probably do this, but I was trekking along at the beginning until about like around that heartbreak hill. Um, at which point, you know, I now call that risk wrist break hill because my wrists were absolutely obliterated. Wow. Um, like there, there was, um, you know, a point in time afterwards I was in the med tents, like you could have gotten like permanent nerve damage in your wrist. Because if you think about like your ankles and your knees, they're built to carry your weight. Your wrists are not built to carry your weight for that amount of time. And, and, and distance. So I started getting this severe pain in my wrist. Uh, like I, I thought they were both broken to be honest. Thankfully they weren't. Wow. But, um, yeah, that was the last like five miles of the race for me. And it was, it was, I mean, every, it was painful, but like every moment was so, so special. The interactions with everybody along the course too, because at that point I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't going for my goal time by any means. So it's like, you know, another runner would come along and, um, and, and just say something nice. I remember this guy, like, you know, who had like a, a bionic leg stopped and says like, you're inspirational. And I'm like, I thought to myself, like, I can't believe he's saying like, he's inspirational. inspirational. Like, I'm, I'm just like, I still have both my legs. I'm like, I finished this and I'm, I'm, I'm done. But like getting those positive comments is just oh, such an incredible community, Boston around that race. Um, just so much positivity. And uh, that was, that was really special for me. And then I, I, I got to the finish line just at that point, like collapsed in pain. The last hundred meters was harder than the first. It took me almost as long as the first several miles. Uh, and then they just brought me to the med tent and I was just so happy. And wow. then, um, and then my, my family found me there and they literally carried me uh, a, a mile because it's actually near the, one of my favorite restaurants, Faux Pasteur at the time, a uh, Vietnamese restaurant. So my, I remember being, you know, my, I was, uh, I have a younger sister and a brother my, my sister Gabriella was, um, I think like holding me on the right side and my dad was holding me on the left side. And they like basically carried me to this restaurant and we sat there my medal was around my neck and I'm having my like pho stew and just super happy. And then slept like a baby. It was, it was such a, uh, a, a beautiful day, but, um, yeah, I mean, that was really the beginning of my story Wow. because I thought that the, that I, I mentioned that the reason I obviously the reason I did this is I fractured my tibia and I thought that was a one-off weird thing like not weird thing I mean I, I trained really hard and you get a stress fracture and it develops into a more serious fracture okay but um that was only the tip of the iceberg I started developing more fractures and I couldn't get back into running my fractures wouldn't heal mm. they just got worse and worse and um to the point that, you know, I, I, there was the first year of running, I could run like 3000 miles in a year, no problem, run hundred mile weeks, no problem. And then it was like, I couldn't run 40 miles mm. and then I couldn't run 20 mile weeks. And then I couldn't run, uh, after a couple of years, a 5k, I had, um, almost given up on distance running. And I joined the triathlon team at this point, I was in college at, uh, at Dartmouth and my, during our first race, I was running a 5k, um, as part of a sprint triathlon. And I just shattered this bone in my foot. It was actually pretty funny because <laughs> I came in, um, I think it was the third, um, and, and people were, and we were looking over my times on the team and it's like, Oh, Nick, like if you actually add up your bike, your swim and your run, like you were, you were first, but my, <laughs> my 
turn around, my, my turn times um, going from one state to the other were terrible because, you know, I should transition, say, from the, um, like, run to the bike in a couple of minutes, but uh, I couldn't because I couldn't get my damn shoe on for the bike wow. because my foot was so swollen. Wow, and a I couple minutes tops. I mean, you should be in and out of there by like a minute. Well, it took me like four minutes to get my one wow. my one shoe on. Wow. Um, I just couldn't get it on anyway. So um, th- that's that's just a tangent. But but that was a weird break. And I remember going to the um, uh, orthopedist and and saying, you know, you know, he got a scan. He's like, this is weird. Like I've never I've done this for forty years. I've never seen someone break a bone like this. And I've been begging for years for a uh, a DEXA scan, a bone density scan. Um, but I just kept on being told like your bone density is going to be fine. You have no history of, no, no family history of osteoporosis, um, no major genetic abnormalities that we can find. Your testosterone is normal. Your BMI is normal. So the thing that doesn't make any sense to me about all of this, like the doctor is like, I, I know what your past was. I know that other, you know, accomplishment you had in middle school with the push push the push-up challenge was so cool, but I've also read about what you were eating and you were consuming tons and tons of special K and skim milk. So of course you had tons of calcium, tons of minerals fortified in this complete breakfast. We just lost special K as a show sponsor. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I was, I was going by the standard guidelines. I was very aware of my calcium. I, I thought I was nutritionally tuned in eating tons of fruit uh, and vegetables and things like cliff bars as energy bars. Um, and, and, you know, just following the standard guidelines for what like a healthy young runner should do. Now, I did indulge in food as well on top of, you know, my five a day and my healthy whole grains um, being a kid. But like, you know, I was a lean kid out of six pack. I figured I could get away with it. Plus, I was running like crazy. So, I, you know, I thought I you know, it was appropriate to fuel as they would tell you. And I got all my calcium, my vitamin D levels were normal. So like none of the basic stuff. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I, I had they they diagnosed me with severe osteoporosis, like the bones of a seven year old woman. Wow. My I was well over three standard deviations below normal, um, which is kind of scary. And I had fractures upon like a whole body scan and in my femur and my hip and my spine, like little fractures everywhere. Wow. So that was really scary for me, also because there wasn't a clear diagnosis. We can go into the diagnosis of exclusion I was given, um, which ended up probably being wrong, almost certainly. But um, bottom line, there, there wasn't a clear answer, and that was really hard for me because um, I felt like I'd earned it. Like I wanted life to be a meritocracy. Like I worked my butt off to be in that race. I have no problem putting the work in, training, studying you know, for the push-up challenge, doing like 2000 push-ups a day, train for that. Like I can put the work in, that's not the problem. And to think I have the will to do this and I'm being robbed of it because I'm sick and nobody can tell me why that, that was really hard for me. Mm. Um, and I struggled with that. Um, over, a, you know, over time, over a couple of years, I, uh, accepted it. And that's when I got hit with strike two. Um, Continuing on the, the, you know, the way I was eating and, you know, eating in college dining halls is not always the <laughs> most uh, whole food diet, let's just say. But I, I was doing what everybody else was doing. And I was still kind of, you know, getting my five a day, my fruits and veg and, uh, and still working out pretty hard. Like then I swam a lot and did other things uh, and still looked on the surface very healthy. But near the end of college, I got diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, which is an inflammatory bowel disease. And if I thought the, you know, weak bones was bad. Anybody listening that has dealt with an inflammatory bowel disease knows that this is worse. Wow. <laughs> like this wrecks your life. It makes social events, eating fear, like, you know, anxiety provoking. I didn't have, I was pretty good with my academics. Didn't have, you know, anxiety about going into tests, but I actually then did end up having anxiety going into tests because it was like, what if I need to leave? Like, what if I have a flare? Uh, and when I was graduating, it was the same thing. I was a, the speaker and it's like, I, I really want to do this. You know, I earned, I earned this. I put the work in, I'm, I'm valedictorian. and I want to speak, but I'm actually really scared because I'm in front of a lot of 11,000 people. What if I like, I have a flare? Mm. Like, what if I have like basically blood come out my anus mm. in front of all those people like being recorded? Uh, cause you just can't help it. And sometimes the pain is so severe. Like I would just, you know, I couldn't continue my speech if I had really severe pain mm. and, and and it would be very obvious. And I didn't want to go viral for that reason. So that's 
what I was dealing with and I, I hit it pretty well. You did People a great job. I watched that speech this morning. You did an amazing job. I was, I was curious. I was going to ask you like if things would have gone South, like what would have happened? That's, that's terrible. I have no idea. I, um, yeah, I mean, I had a little gurgle afterwards, but it, it, um, and luckily nothing happened. It was one of those things. It's like when I had the opportunity, it's like, I just, I was, I, I I'm a very much a yes man and I'm conscious of my fears. So when they come up and I'm like, I, there's a chance that I'm going to say no to this opportunity just because I'm scared. Then I'm like, that, that can't be like, I just have to go for it. Mm. Um, and so I, d- thankfully that came off nicely. I think, um, it was, it was, you know, it was what it was. Um, and then, so I, I graduated, um, and then went to Oxford, uh, to do my PhD. I was going to do a PhD at Oxford, then go to Harvard for med school. And so, okay, I lost my, you know, my running career, which sucked. And then my social life was in the tanks. Um, and you know, my, my stomach hurt and I used to love food. I was a huge foodie and then I didn't like that, but at least I have my academics. Like this is something that defines me. And so I can focus on that. Right. And then that gets robbed. <laughs> I get robbed of that too, because I can't focus on my academics when my, my health really goes to um, shit, so to speak. Sorry uh, for, for cussing. But no, not at all. After I moved to Oxford, my colitis got so severe that uh, I just started dropping body weight like gangbusters and I, I couldn't stop it. And um, uh, I ended up you know, having such severe stomach pain at one point. The university rushed me to the hospital one night at 2 a.m., um, and I was just there for stomach pain, but they started doing tests and, you know, they take your vitals and they're like, Oh, geez, like his heart rate. Now, as a point of reference, a low heart rate termed bradycardia is anything below 60 beats per minute. Wow. My heart rate was 28 wow. on admission. Wow. Um, that's kind of scary. So, uh, it's a public health system, the NHS in, in England. And so they, they ended up not having a lot of capacity. They shuffled me over to the palliative care ward, which is the death ward. So I'm the youngest person there probably by like 50, 60 years. There are people around me. It's the first time I ever experienced death. Somebody died with dementia running around. I couldn't sleep for the three days I was there because I was hooked up to monitors that would, would, you couldn't turn the alarm off if my heart rate dropped below 30. So basically I just couldn't sleep and all the screaming. And, um, and after those three days, I got discharged with a heart rate in the twenties. It was, uh, and, and, and really with no answer, they threw something at me. That was a terrible hypothesis. And I, I don't speak ill of my physicians except for this singular episode and other physicians in my life would back me. Like you do not discharge someone with a heart rate that low under the auspices that their heart rate is in the twenties because of turmeric. Yes, that's right. <laughs> the spice turmeric. I was going to ask you I, about it, that. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's complete nonsense. There was, um, a isolated, I remember her coming into the room and posing this hypothesis after I've been poked and prodded by a cardiology team had been, you know, talked to me about pacemakers, blah, blah, blah. And she found an isolated case report from, uh, Mexico about a woman having, you know, acute to, uh, curcumin poisoning from having too much curcumin, which is the, uh, active compound in turmeric. And I was taking curcumin for my ulcerative colitis. It's anti-inflammatory. So my GI doc had kind of recommended it as an herbal supplement. So I was taking it, but that was acute turmeric poisoning. I had been taking this for six months with no problem, um, you know, continuously, uh, chronically. So it it wasn't the same scenario. Plus the half-life of human in the body, which is the amount of time it takes for half the substance to get removed from the body is about six to seven hours. And I had been there for over 72 hours. So like 12 half-lifes. So there was no, there should be no compound in my body and my heart rate still hadn't come off. Wow. Like there was no way that this hypothesis was accurate, but, but I was discharged nonetheless. So in general, my, my endocrinology team, my bone team, my gut team, like they're all phenomenal. Like this is the one singular episode I'm a little bit like bitter about, but I actually thank them for it because it was the straw that broke, well, my back in this case rather than the camels. Um, I just, I just wanted to get out of there at that point. And I went back to my room and I just lay prone in my bed until my heart rate came back up a couple of days later. I don't know why. Um, I was actually, that was actually my 23rd birthday. Wow. I remember being my 23rd birthday, sipping a, like a vanilla pudding, like, like liquid drink as a meal supplement, because that's all I could handle. 
And um, just thinking to myself, like I, I'm out of, I, I'm just hopeless. Like I've been relying on, on other people to fix me. And I don't know what it is about me. You know, these are all the most brilliant people of the world, like doctors at Harvard and Oxford. And, and I'm, I'm still sick. Like I, I thought medicine knew it all, which is, you know, I, I realize now naive, but I was, a, I was a kid. And like, you just, you want to think your doctors are omniscient and that's not a fair thing to expect of them. And they're not, they can't, fix everybody. And I just was at this point where I'm like, I, I don't believe that someone else is going to fix me and I'm really hopeless. And so what are my options? Well, I can't continue just studying like this, although I, I did continue my studies at an extra stop, but, um, I, you know, I need to fix this. This isn't sustainable. I can't go to med school, be a doctor like this. Um, so it's one option, really one option is try to find a solution for myself. And I, I had no expectations that I would do it, but I had no other options. Right. Um, so I then went kind of outside conventional practice and I started experimenting with different things. So supplements, probiotics, like different exercises, different meditations, et cetera, and a ton of different diets. And I did not believe the diet was a powerful tool for disease. Depending on who's listening, they may you know agree with that perspective or think, wow, this kid was dumb, but I, I honestly didn't, mm. um, Nevertheless, I thought I'd give it a shot. So I tried, you know, all the diets that I could possibly think of. I went through the list. So for, you know, gut issues, they have low FODMAP. So I tried that. Eh, it didn't really work that well. Specific carbohydrate diet, eh. Gluten-free, casein-free, Mediterranean, you know, uh, pescatarian, uh, vegetarian, vegan, everything you can think of. And the one diet I was really reluctant to try, the most fatty, F-A-D-D-Y, like a fad, <laughs> uh, although it's fatty, <laughs> diet, it. that, that I could think that that was not an intended pun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was a terrible pun, so nobody <laughs> judges that one. I, I'd hope I'm more clever than that. But it was a ketogenic diet. So you read a lot of negative things in the press about ketogenic diets, um, which I now realize is a lot of misrepresentation. But... I just had this, this visceral reaction to the concept of a, you know, a high fat, low carb diet. It's so counter to everything I've been being told, including by you know, all my uh, clinicians and all the nutritionists and dietitians, even that had worked with me around my bone health and this, that, and the other, it's like, you know, many small meals base your, you know, diet on healthy whole grains and whole food carbs. And, um, you know, eat in moderation, all these catch terms that we hear. And they just made so much sense to me. They were so intuitive. And so to do something different than that, so opposite, to reduce carbohydrates, which I thought were essential, and to eat lots of fat, which I thought would clog my arteries, I thought, like, this is this is dumb. But at that point, I'm, I'm like, eh, I have nothing to lose. Like, if I have a heart attack at 50, who cares <laughs> at this point? <laughs> so I tried it. And... It, it was, I mean, it literally was life-saving for me. My, within a week, my um, colitis symptoms were gone. One week. Better than they had ever been. One week. And in, in, in hand with that, my, my inflammation markers had dropped. So you can get your inflammation checked in your stool and colitis is called calprotectin. And I was usually running above like at least three times the high of normal. Um, and they dropped my levels dropped into the normal range quite low about, they dropped about eight fold in a week. And, um, I just felt great. And I was really energized, which was weird for me. I forgot what it was like to be energized because at that point I had gone from being, you know, someone who could run marathons and, and under three hours to like the 10 minute walk to lab was like my marathon. And so that energy again was unbelievable. Um, and to see, you know, my, my, my markers of health, my inflammation markers getting better and to feel better, like, this was, this was, I, I didn't even know what it was. I was just happy it was happening. I didn't care how it worked. Wow. And so that, that just, you know, it, it, well, like I said, it was life-changing. I, it sounds cliche, but I have no better way to say it. Mm. Um, and that was still actually, it's only the beginning of my story wow. <laughs> because, because throughout all of this, I thought I was a medical, what they call a medical zebra. So like an oddball. Um, and in some sense I was, 
And, you know, when I had such a strong reaction to a ketogenic diet and how it improved me, I thought, okay, this is still weird. It's working for me, but this is, I, this is an outlier. Great. I'm healthy again. I can finish my PhD. I can go to Harvard med. I can get my MD and then practice conventional medicine. That was my mindset until I started getting involved with the metabolic health community. And I can define that in a sec if you want. And the really actually looking at the scientific literature, not like the guidelines that are just put forth by these government bodies or these, you know, secondhand from these institutes, but actually reading the primary scientific literature, like thousands and thousands of papers. Mm. Um, I've since gone around and tried to plant some trees to make up for all the, the trees I killed printing out all those papers because I'm a hard copy guy, but it really just, it, it shocked me and confused me because what I was seeing all around me was really, so first of all, analogous stories to mine of people really struggling in conventional medicine, be it with ulcerative colitis, be it with epilepsy, be it with mental illnesses, be it with diabetes, whatever. These different metabolic diseases, which I now realize are all different manifestations of the same problem. Yes. And we can get into that. But, um, and then looking at the literature and seeing, wow, there's actually literature to support why this approach would work to improve metabolic diseases and recover metabolic health. And there's actually very literature, very little literature supporting the standard guidelines. So now I'm like, I'm faced with this dilemma of, okay, I'm, I, I, I'm now looking at a population, you know, health perspective and I'm seeing what we're doing doesn't work. I mean, since the guidelines were implemented in 1980, obesity rates have only, you know, increased at a faster rate along with things like diabetes and Alzheimer's. And I got better and I'm seeing people around me get better. And I see the scientific mechanistic literature and like the randomized controlled trials. And they all kind of point to the same thing. It's like, what are we doing? Yep. And this is the point where I, I got confused and, and, um, and passionate about figuring out why we have this discrepancy and how I can spend my life now, my medical career, my professional career in every capacity, trying to shift things uh, in a way such that people don't have to go through this path that people do now where they suffer and they suffer with metabolic diseases until they become a little bit disillusioned, unfortunately, and they grasp for straws. And some of them find a solution like I did in metabolic health, a part of which is food is medicine. And that sounds kind of quirky and uh, hand wavy and frou frou, but <laughs> I'm, you know, you can hear me on other podcasts or read some of the papers I've written. Like I'm a hard science guy. So when I say this, you know, this is not frou frou, this is hardcore science. Like it is, this is the basis of health, yep. metabolic health and food. Yep. So that that's, I, I never would have thought that. The name of the article that you wrote for STAT, which immediately grabbed my attention, I don't even think I finished the full thing before I was already like, get this dude's email, we got to talk to this guy. A ketogenic diet brought me back to life while believing in its effectiveness make me a pariah in medical school. I mean, think about that. Yeah. First things first, I did not come up with that title. <laughs> the editor did <laughs> in full transparency. That said, there's an element of that. It's something I kind of battle with. It's like, I'm going into a conventional system where what I think is right based on my understanding of the literature and my experiences and, you know, not only anecdotes, but people that I've helped clinically, I actually, I work as a metabolic health practitioner now, not out of, I, I didn't aim to do that, but I started, I was running clinical trials in Oxford and I kept on pointing people to nutritionists who wanted to, you know, they were involved in the trial and I would talk to them about nutrition, you know, while we were just being around. And then they'd want to get their diet into and after the study. So I point them at nutritionist. They come back saying, Nick, this isn't working for me. Can you help me? And I kept on saying, no, 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 until I finally, it's like, I just have to say yes. Because like I said, I'm a yes man. And I started just applying the principles and seeing phenomenal results. But people reversing diabetes and pre-diabetes, having neurological symptoms improve, dropping weight and finding it actually really easy to lose weight and maintain weight and get healthier by all blood markers, cardiovascular risk, like diabetes markers, everything. And, and so I, you know, now I'm working with people clinically and like, wow, I, this isn't actually that hard once you understand the principle. So what's going on. So, you know, I'm pretty confident. I, I, I hedged probably more in the article, just as a somewhat of a tactful move. And also to be, you know, humble about my perspective, I realize my, my point in life and career, but yeah, I'm pretty confident that this needs to be part of mainstream medicine. Metabolic health needs to be part of mainstream medicine. And I know a lot of clinicians that would agree with me. Um, that said, how do I 
really bring that message forward strategically. And, and I'm, you know, I'm not a, uh, established authority in the terms of like, I'm not an MD PhD with a 20 year career. Um, but I'm in a kind of unique position to talk to my peers, um, while also being really involved in the research. So I'm still running clinical trials. I'm still writing papers. I'm still, you know, I'll, I'll be lecture. I'm lecturing on this stuff internationally now. So wow. I'm in a kind of quirky spot, but I'm, I'll be, I'll, I'll um, be more optimistic than pessimistic. I know that there is a lot of pushback you see on media, but when I talk to, you know, my, my peers, you know, incoming medical students, medical students, uh, and even, even clinicians that I now work with at Harvard, um, they agree if they really take the time, um, and we talk and over time, they tend to agree. They're like, you know, I agree. It's like, we know what we're doing is not working to address the diseases that are most affecting us. Obesity, diabetes, Alzheimer's, things like this. We know we need an alternative because this is not sustainable. If we keep going the rate we're going, one in three people will have diabetes by mid-century. We'll be spending $3 billion per day on Alzheimer's disease. You know, not to mention the burden of that disease is going to triple. And that, I think, is the scariest disease of all. What we're doing is just not sustainable economically or just for, you know, the, the cost of human life and suffering. So we need something alternative. And mm -hmm. if you just, you know, ask the right questions and pose a little bit of literature and then show people patient stories, they get interested if nothing else, I'm very optimistic that, you know, we're going to see it. We're kind of hitting an inflection point. And um, I think we will see a change in the next 10 to 15 years. So I'm wow. actually relatively confident about that. Wow. Um, That's amazing so to hear. That sense, I'm very excited. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So I ran a metabolic cart for 13 years and that was amazing. And I loved having the term um, metabolic in my job title, which was great. Um, Tell us a little bit about what, what does a metabolic health practitioner do? And then yes. I think, I think we haven't really gotten too far into explaining people what, what are ketones? What is keto? What is the sure. ketogenic diet? And what is the difference between the three? Because I think people, you know, are curious about this stuff, but they, they don't understand like, should we be chugging butter? Is this keto? Is that keto? Am I keto? Are, are people supposed to be keto? Like what, how does all that stuff kind of work? A hundred percent. Okay. So where I want to start, um, I'm going to, I'm going to table the keto thing for a sec, because I want to lay the foundation of this concept of metabolic health and metabolic medicine. Perfect. And so the way I define metabolic, um, medicine is it's evidence informed practices, lifestyle practices that don't necessarily require drugs that target the root causes of disease. So let's take, for example, diabetes type two diabetes, the root cause of that disease is insulin resistance, leading to high insulin levels, hyperinsulinemia, and also high glucose levels as your beta cells fail. So to target the root cause of that disease, um, you need to address the insulin resistance to the high insulin, the hyperinsulinemia, and the high glucose, which actually just requires getting carbohydrates out of your diet. Um, so, you know, that would be sort of a metabolic health approach to type two diabetes. And guess what? When you, you look at the clinical trials on that, it works really, really well. Diabetes reversal defined as, you know, getting off medications and getting your HbA1c below 5.7 over 50% insane, um, in a year and maintained over multiple years. Um, there are multiple trials on that. You can look up the Verda health study and frontiers and endocrinology mm -hmm. in 2019, David yep. Unwin's work from last year, like multiple big trials. And, you know, just the logic behind it. All right, you have this disease of high insulin and high glucose. So let's remove the thing in your diet that's boosting the insulin and glucose, and maybe things will get better. That makes sense. Just logically, that should make sense. What are we actually doing for that disease? Like, what is the standard of care treatment right now? Give someone with hyperinsulinemia, high insulin, more insulin. Mind blowing. Just absolutely mind blowing. It, to reduce their glucose. You're looking at that endpoint, and it's like, yeah, you're. You're managing symptoms just fine, but it's actually exacerbating the disease in the long run. So that's why, you know, a disease like diabetes, patients are told, you know, if you have type 2 diabetes, it's an irreversible and progressive condition. And, and that's just frankly not true. You can't cure type 2 diabetes. There's a difference between reversing it, getting rid of all the, the markers and health issues associated with it and curing it. I'm not saying you can cure it with the ketogenic diet, but you can effectively get rid of all the health issues associated with it, which is all that matters. You can have perfect glycemic control. You can have, you know, 
no problems with your blood vessels or impact on your brain. Um, potentially there's a little caveat to that, but you know, you can reverse that disease and it's true for a lot of diseases. That's just the easiest case in point. But when you look at the discrepancy between standard approaches, which just because of the incentive structure of our medical system is built on drugs versus addressing the root causes of disease through lifestyle um, and metabolic medicine. Again, this is like evidence informed. You, we can dig into the nitty gritty about, you know, how say something like exercise alters TBC, 1D4 activity, or, you know, tug protein cleavage and the C terminal going to activate PGC1 alpha and the, you know, mitochondria to alter X, Y, and Z and thermic effective food. Like everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. What, what I'm just saying is like <laughs> when I, it's, it's hard for me because I remember what it was like to think, oh, food is medicine. Like, is this fruity? And, and now to see, like, I'm looking in the hardcore science and the randomized control trials, I'm like, everything fits. Mm. This makes so much sense. And it works. And I'm seeing it work in the people I'm working with. Um, and yet, standard of care is still those drugs. And people are still getting sicker. And they don't realize there's an alternate option, um, which is metabolic health. I mean, big picture, the diseases that used to kill humans were infectious diseases. So we built a medical system to target those infectious diseases and more or less COVID aside, although actually I'd argue that that is under, um, you know, metabolic, poor metabolic health contributes to the COVID pandemic in large part. For the most part, the diseases that are crippling us are chronic metabolic diseases, diabetes, Alzheimer's, mental illnesses, all these things. And this is the key point. All these diseases, be it schizophrenia and depression, be it Alzheimer's, be it colitis, be it osteoporosis. Well, not all osteoporosis, but <laughs> my osteoporosis. I guess I'm being egocentric now. They're like different branches on the same tree. They all have different leaves, different foliage. And so it's very easy to focus on that and see them as different diseases. And they, again, in a sense they are, but they connect to a common trunk, which are these basic metabolic pathologies associated with most metabolic diseases, things like inflammation, and insulin resistance. And we find that we can address those by feeding the roots properly with things like proper nutrition. No matter what the metabolic condition is, it improves. I mean, I'm running a case report right now on a guy whose COPD improved massively. His lung function got better. There are studies coming on like, you know, Alzheimer's improving. I just wrote a paper that came out two days ago on Alzheimer's prevention with like low carb and ketogenic diets. And, um, you know, even things that are kind of extreme, like I, I have some colleagues with uh, data on uh, atherosclerosis by uh, measured by CAC score and CIMT score actually regressing on this high fat diet. I know it sounds counterintuitive and we can explain why you not what you eat, as people say, why eating fat doesn't add to more fat in your bloodstream or make you fat. But um, yeah, I mean, that that's the metabolic health concept in a, uh, a nutshell. Is there something I could clarify there before we move on? No, that's great. Um, oh, I'm sitting next to the book, uh, Why We Get Sick by Ben Bickman, and he talks about the same oh. thing. It's it's the same, it's all the same branches on the same tree. Like it, it comes from the same spot. And then it's also like, I'm sitting next to The Big Fat Surprise by Nina Teichels. And she talked about writing her book, which took 10 years. And the number of times she had to like stop herself and be like, wait, this can't, this can't be yeah. What I'm saying it is there, there has to be a catch. It, it, it's almost like as you're running through all of these things, it sounds like almost like snake oil. Like there's no way one diet change can fix all of those issues or at least improve all of those issues. And I, I agree with you. I have seen it so many times. Yeah. I mean, that's the remarkable, first of all, I love Nina and I love Ben. They're both, uh, friends of a sort. Um, I've been on podcasts with Ben and, and, Nina's just wonderful. We've spoken. So Amazing. I'm glad you're in tune with those people. Yeah. Ben, first, I just have to applaud Ben. He's like one of the best people in metabolic health. He's just the sweetest man. If you ever talk to him, if you haven't had him on this podcast, you should. Oh, we've had him both. But They're I haven't great. read his book quite yet, but he's, he's just, he's the best. And if you want to learn about insulin resistance, Ben Bickman is your man. Yep. Um, so anyway, th that aside, uh, everybody knows that that's not news to anybody that's probably hearing me speak, but um, yeah, it's just like, People come into this really trying to prove themselves wrong. So a good scientist should prove themselves wrong. Anybody coming into this, like most people that even now are saying like on the carnivore diets, like Dr. Paul Saladino, they're like, this is stupid. Like I'm a vegan, starts vegan, or a lot of people start vegan or, you know, with a standard approach. 
um, you know, they're five a day and it's, you know, it doesn't work super well for them. And even when they try something else, like this is stupid. Like I, there's a catch. There's something weird's going on here. There's no way this works. There's no way this works. And you're trying to poke down your own hypothesis by looking at all the literature um, and doing different experiments. And then you realize you can't. You realize that like every, it's, it's mind blowing because you just, you can't imagine that what we're being told is wrong. When the data are looking you in the face, you know, you just, you can't imagine that it doesn't make sense until you go back and read, you know, like the, you know, 483 page report behind the USDA dietary guidelines. And like, this is nonsense. Like this is actually kind of bad data and then look at the history of it. And then you realize we're actually being, being misled. And that's such a difficult thing to convince people of, uh, because like it's, it's, he said, she said, why would you believe me? I just got my PhD. I'm a 25 year old. And you have this, like you, these guidelines coming out from the government, um, or not necessarily the government, but like a panel of quote experts, <laughs> no longer what I consider them experts, but it's a, he said, she said, you know, we both know more than the person listening, presumably. So why would you believe me? And that's a really difficult thing because like, if I were in your position and you hadn't dealt with something, you know, some sort of severe health thing that pushed you in this direction, force you in this direction, I, you know, I wouldn't believe me either. That's right. Um, so, you know, it, it's difficult, but the, the, all the science is, um, is more or less there. Um, and then, well, in complete transparency, you know, the guidelines and a lot of these papers that are coming out now, like Eat Lancet for the Planet about plant-based diets, they're getting a lot of flat uh, for being not scientifically rigorous or influenced by, uh, you know, industry funding. Oh, good. We can talk like hours and hours about that as a singular topic. Um, but, but anyway, I won't get on my soapbox about that. Instead, I'll transition to get my soapbox about keto. <laughs> <laughs> Although, first of all, let, let me just clarify. I am not trying to say at any point that everybody needs to go on a ketogenic diet or a low carbohydrate diet. That is not what I'm saying. I do not believe that. I do not believe there is one size fits all best diet, nor do I believe that carbohydrates are an evil macronutrient as you know, some people in the keto sphere, as you could call it, like it might come off as, as seeming. What I would say though, is that there's a distinction between carbohydrates as an isolated macronutrient causing metabolic disease and removing from the carbohydrates from the diet, improving metabolic disease. Mm. Um, and that doesn't matter what carbohydrate source it is. So I'll just give you an example of a trial that was done a couple of years ago by Hyde et al., published in the Journal Journal of Clinical Investigations. And what they showed is that, you know, controlling calories, controlling protein, giving people overall healthy whole foods diets, if you shifted, you know, calories from carbs to calories from fat, metabolic health just improves. So they were looking at people with metabolic syndrome. Um, and this was a randomized crossover trial. So three, four week blocks. And what they found is in just four weeks, a low carb diet, a low carb, high fat diet, um, reverse metabolic syndrome in nine out of the 16 participants. Wow. And those same 16 participants were in another, you know, a low, uh, uh, a low fat, high carb group, same calories, same protein. They're eating their five a day fruits and vegetables. It's actually a very healthy diet on the surface and only one rather than nine out of 16, only one out of 16 has uh, improvement in metabolic syndrome and other things that you wouldn't expect. And we can explain the biology behind it, or I can, if you, if you want, but things like Okay, so the high fat group, they were eating much more fat. They were eating two and a half times as much saturated fat. So 100 grams in that group, 100 grams of saturated fat per day. So you'd expect, oh, compare them to the low fat group. There's saturated fat in their blood and their fat in their blood must be higher. They're dead. What? They're dead. It's lower. It's <laughs> lower. They're eating two and a half times more saturated fat and the saturated fat in their blood is lower. Wow. Um, that's actually because most of the saturated fat in your blood comes from carbohydrates Yep, that's right. and being, you know, metabolically unhealthy. Um, you know, depending on how long we go, I'm happy to, to talk a little bit about the science there, but there's studies showing that, you know, removing carbohydrates can be healthy. And the reason that's relevant is because, okay, if you're already metabolically healthy, maybe you can handle some carbs, maybe you're insulin sensitive, but analyses show that only about 12% this was in 2016, or at least according to the 2016 NHANES data, 12% um, of people were absent of markers of metabolic syndrome, which means 12% of people are metabolically healthy and insulin sensitive. So 
maybe 12% of people can get away with eating carbs. What if you're not in the 12%? What if you're the majority of people, the 88%? And wouldn't it make sense to address you know, dietary guidelines to the 88, 90% of people rather than the 12%? Unbelievable. So maybe the guidelines are just fine for the 12%. Actually, I was in the 12%. It didn't work for me. So I still don't think they, they necessarily work, even if you're in the 12%. But let's just, I, I do want to frame that, that what I'm talking about is mostly those 88%. Because most people are, are metabolically unhealthy. Um, and you don't, you know, you don't always know. You can be very thin, totally normal weight, and, and have metabolic syndrome or have diabetes. In fact, 15% of people, I think, with type 2 diabetes, so tens of millions in the United States, in the United States are on normal weight. Mm. Weight is not a very good proxy for metabolic health. Um, you need other things. So, so that is, you know where I'm coming from. Now, as for keto, a ketogenic diet is um, basically speaking, one that really reduces carbohydrates. So generally less than 25 grams of net carbs per day. So total carbs minus fiber, although there are caveats to that. You can eat more. Some people can't eat more. Some people need less. Um, And it's moderate in protein. So like I eat one gram per pound of uh, uh, protein, per pound of body weight, uh, protein per day. And then, you know, it's, it's really rich in fat, like lots and lots of fat. I eat probably 350 grams of fat a day. Mm. Um, that's probably mo- more than most people. I have a pretty high energy needs, but a lot of fat. So that's generally what it looks like. And um, it's, it's an ex- a, a more on the extreme end of just what I would call therapeutic carbohydrate reduction. TCR. So, um, depending on what ails you, you know, keto is not an all in or all out thing. Like yes, you have to be at a certain level to get into the metabolic state of ketosis, which I'll explain in a minute. But if you're just trying to, you know, lower your blood glucose levels and improve your insulin sensitivity, say you have diabetes, then it's not like you have to eat fewer than 25 grams of carbs per day, or it doesn't work. It's just about, you know, it's all on a spectrum. So for a lot of metabolic diseases, it's just about, I would say, first principle, getting rid of sugars and refined grains in your diet, which are effectively the same thing because refined grains are sugar. That's right. Um, you know, if you do that and you're eating a, a whole foods diet, that's also low in like sugary tropical fruits, which are also problematic for a lot of people, then, you know, you're going to have a lot of improvement in your health. That alone will do a lot. Um, now, keto does have certain metabolic advantages, um, being in the state of ketosis, which is where your, um, body, your liver mostly turns fat into these ketone molecules. So, so ketone molecules, they, there are really three forms. There's beta hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, and acetone. Acetone is like a waste product. You blow it out in your breath. That's that fruity smell. If you have keto breath, yep. um, Acetoacetate and, and, and beta hydroxybutyrate are, are both more active forms. Beta hydroxybutyrate is probably the, the the primary one. It's the one mostly found in your blood. And so, um, what these molecules are are um, well, they have two natures. I think this is really important that they have two natures, not just one. The one nature that gets talked about a lot is oh, they're great fuel. They're like brain fuel, and they are like ketones are probably the best brain fuel. Uh, a brain running on ketones is, is generally a pretty healthy brain, which is why ketogenic diets help improve the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. There was actually just a trial came out uh, this year, Phillips et al., showing that as compared to a low-fat diet, a ketogenic diet massively outperformed, uh, that low, the ketogenic diet outperformed low-fat diet in improving Alzheimer's disease quality of life and daily functioning mm. significantly. Uh, that was a New Zealand study. Other conditions like Parkinson's disease, you know, there's there's so many, epilepsy, of course, mental illnesses as well. Yep. And I can give you papers to link, you know, in the notes, uh, a plethora of them. Like I said, there's a lot of data on this, but you know, ketones are great brain fuel. That's their first nature. Their second nature though, is their phenomenal signaling molecules. They're like hormones. They have their own receptors on cell surfaces, G protein coupled receptors. They go inside cells to change how the ways, the way genes are expressed and they modify proteins. There was a paper that just came out that showed, um, you know, that molecule beta hydroxybutyrate. This is in Science uh, Advances, I think. You know, modifies directly modifies like bind to, binds to and modifies 
um, I think it was 1,397 unique proteins, wow. including DNA histones at 36 different sites to change the way your genes are expressed, the way your DNA is expressed. And there, you know, there are so many advantages and so many different tissues from the pancreas to the heart to, you know, the, the brain, of course, that's my area of expertise. And so I just, I just want to point that out that, you know, ketones as a molecules, they're great fuel and they're great, um, uh, signaling molecules really. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the last thing I'll say before I, I do want to just pause for a second. So you can ask questions. I feel like I've just been talking and talking and talking, but, um, to dispel this myth that ketogenic diets are a fad, like I said at the beginning, this is what I thought, um, because they're not. In fact, I would say they're more appropriately a rebranding of the oldest human diet. So low fat is a fat. It's new. People jumped onto it. It doesn't really work. Yep. It doesn't really make sense with our biology. But if you think back, it's like, okay, why are, ask the question. So what is a ketogenic diet? A ketogenic diet is one in which your body makes ketones. Okay. Humans are the best animals at making ketones. Why would that be? Uh, what else are we, you know, what else distinguishes us? Well, our big brains. And it turns out that during evolution, we would need to be able to do ketogenesis, making ketones, because if we didn't, the only other option to feed our hungry brains would be to basically degrade our lean muscle tissue, our skeletal muscle, our heart, et cetera, to make some sugar for the brain. And then we would have starved very, very quickly yep. when we didn't have carbohydrates around, which a lot of the time we didn't, especially like today. Um, you know, I, this is a controversial opinion, but things like I consider like a banana, I consider that a processed food mm. because people are like, oh, it's a natural, but we didn't grow up, like evolve with these foods around frequently. And when they were around that banana had not been artificially selected. It looked like right. the size of your fist. It had big seeds and very little sugar. Yep. Plus you worked really hard to get it and you only got it seasonally. Seasonally. Yes. That's yeah. so oh. important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. So, um, well, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I'm not, well, we can get into cyclic keto later, but anyway, um, this, you know, we went into ketosis all the time as a species and no, we, we also ate carbs. That's totally true. Um, but we were going into and out of ketosis and remaining, I guess I would say in that 12%, which most people are not now. So effectively in the modern era, we're starving our body from being able to delve into the fat based operating system which, you know, is our metabolic operating system. And most of us can't go there anymore. Um, and so, you know, adapting to a ketogenic diet, actually more than just generating ketones, it resets metabolism in a way that is um, in agreement with how our species evolved, how it was supposed to evolve and how we're supposed to run. Not on free Krispy Kremes after you get your vaccine, which just ticks me off that people are doing So that. dumb, but, so dumb. Uh, yeah, that, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But um you know, versus things like, like fat and including fatty animal products. Um, and you don't have to do keto that way. We can talk about different ways to do keto. You mentioned I had a book coming out on a Mediterranean ketogenic diet. People can do that. I've helped people on vegetarian and even vegan ketogenic diets. There's lots of different ways to get your body into that proper metabolic operating system. And when you do that, you'll be astonished at the kind of conditions that improve and the best part for me is it's always like things improve in people that they didn't expect. Like so many times people come and they're like, you know, Nick, can you help me lose weight? Because that's what I hear, you know, keto's for. Yep. yep. And, and I notice other things like, okay, they're pre-diabetic. Okay. They have some, you know, sometimes they have mental health issues, sometimes serious. Um, and, and what inevitably happens is they lose the weight. Um, but concurrent with that, they say like, like my OCD is gone. Like, this is so weird. My anxiety has gone. And, and, you know, my glucose levels are better. My, my doctor's like, what, what are you doing? Like, I, I have never seen someone, you know, get off insulin and now you just don't eat it. Um, it's pretty, pretty cool to see it because is. again, it's affecting that trunk of the tree. And so what comes with that is healthier branches all around, even things you weren't expecting. Mm. 
Man, I love that. I'm, I'm so glad that you talked about ketones as a signaling molecule because I think that's overlooked quite a bit. And one area that I saw it in all the time was measuring metabolic rate. And, and you've already mentioned metabolism so much and that reset on your metabolism. And it took me a long time to wrap my brain around what was going on because people would be on a low carbohydrate diet. Um, they'd be eating more fat. They'd be eating a decent amount of protein. They'd be losing tons of weight. And I would measure their resting metabolic rate and it would be hundreds of calories higher than, you know, the last time we did their test or mm -hmm. hundreds of calories higher than where it should be for somebody that's their same age, height, weight, and gender. And one of the things yeah. that helped me understand as part of a mechanism is the ketones acting on the fat cells to help brown them. Meaning they're, you're teaching your body to just start wasting energy in the form of heat. And, wow. and that's increasing metabolism. Ben, Ben Bigman was one of the ones who helped me understand that because otherwise I couldn't, I couldn't explain to these people like, yeah, I mean, your, meta your metabolism is great. It's going really well. And I wish I, I don't exactly understand the mechanism of, of why it took me a long time to wrap my head around that. Yeah. I don't think we really understand it that well. In fact, a lot of the times it's, it's, it's curious because there's a discrepancy. If you just do a basic, you know, indirect calorimetry and, and, um, or red calorimetry and measure like a, a basal metabolic rate, it actually will often be even normal on a ketogenic diet, which is interesting sometimes when people lose weight though, because their Betty's bill and basal metabolic rate should be going down and it stays steady, right? Which is interesting. But but um if it's normal, yet they need more calories to sustain weight, you know, at, at a maintenance weight, uh, or they can just eat a lot more and it's confusing. And so I think it's more than, I don't think you always necessarily see it on a basal metabolic rate, but here are just, I'll just throw out some things just to kind of give you a picture of all the things that could be going on, well, not all the things, but some of the things. So you mentioned something like, you know, fat beijing. Um, so, you know, white fat can turn brownish. And I don't know the degree to which that really happens in humans to a clinically meaningful extent. I, I'm not so convinced there, but things like, um, there was a paper that just came out. I mentioned that tug protein earlier. So, um, it had to do with what's called quote, the thermic effect of food. And so the thermic effect of food is the phenomenon that about 10% of the calories you eat are associated with a burning phenomenon, uh, associated with eating. So if you eat a 2000 calorie diet, then say 200 calories are going to be burned as a result of eating food. And you would think, oh, that's just the energy required to digest the food. But no, actually it's not. It's a, a carefully choreographed metabolic coupling that happens all over the body, including in muscle cells. And one thing they found recently, uh, this is a, this is a mouse trial, but I think it would generalize to humans because the mechanism is so conserved is that, you know, if you become obese or insulin resistant, you don't need to be obese to be insulin resistant. Basically, if you're insulin resistant, then the thermic effect of food should go down because um, insulin can't signal the cleavage of this tug protein to increase metabolic rate after you eat. Mm. And so energy expenditure after you eat, which wouldn't be seen in a fasting indirect calorimetry will go down. Also changes in the microbiome are crazy. Um, including decreased, you know, inflammatory cells, TH17 reshuffling of, you know, the gut microbiome in a way that, and I don't have literature to say this bug is burning more calories, but in a way that just it might incre increase metabolic rate. Just on the time course I see with people, sometimes it's really weird. And this happened with me. It's like, okay, I'm at a weight I'm happy with. Uh, you know, in order to maintain that, I need to eat, you know, 3,000 calories per day. And then like a couple months later, it's like, I need to eat 3,200 calories, then 3,300, then three. It just kind of keeps creeping up as you're adapting. And the adaptations can go over a long period of time. But stuff like that, stuff like, changing insulin sensitivity in your brain. There's studies showing that, you know, your brain, the hypothalamus, which controls all your body's hormones, controls how you partition fuel. So people with insulin resistant hypothalamus is they gain back weight uh, more readily. And this has been shown in, in, in recent trials as well, one last year, or even maybe this year uh, in science, one of the science journals. And um, it also importantly partition it into the unhealthiest if that's a word, most unhealthy fat storage, the visceral fat, which sits inside your abdominal cavity. And so, you know, visceral fat will create inflammation. It'll decrease your muscle mass or your ability to build muscle. Then you have a lower base of metabolic rate because you can't build muscle and you have that coupling. And then there's things like, this was, a, a this is a, a nugget of knowledge for Ben Bickman. Um, but just, just to continue, like how nuanced this stuff is like fructose. We hear about how fructose is bad for you. One of the things fructose does is it makes fat cells more sensitive to the stress hormone cortisol. 
Um, and so what that can do, because subcutaneous fat, which is a more healthy fat, um, when it's stimulated by cortisol, often it'll engage in fat breakdown or lipolysis, but visceral fat will engage in lipogenesis. And it basically reshuffles the fat to the least healthy store in your body. Mm. Again, contributing to metabolic disease and potentially slowing metabolic rate over time. And then there's more studies. One just came out with David Ludwig showing that, you know, if you are, you know, have lost weight and then all things being equal protein and, and, uh, calories, but you just switch out, you know, carbs for fat, then you have less blood flow to the reward region of your brain. Whereas if you're eating more carbs, you have a 43 to 51% increase in basically blood flow to the nucleus accumbens, the reward region of your brain, making you want to eat more food. And so making it hard to maintain weight. I'm, I'm not saying all of this because I expect people to retain it. I'm saying all of this because I, maybe I'm overcompensating for the fact that like, it's so much complicated, more complicated than what we're told. The concepts of things like calories in, calories out, eat intuitively, that's downstream in the pathway. And we think we can control it. We think we can just be like, all right, I'm going to like listen really hard and my body's going to tell me what to eat. Or I'm going to try to just quote, eat in moderation, but you can't do that in an addictive food environment. Or I'm going to try to control my calories in and calories out. Actually, you can't do that over the long run for a bunch of reasons that I could talk about for hours. Um, but that's where we are right now with a little bit of shallow thinking about health. Uh, and if you just flip the paradigm and start thinking about how do we correct metabolism first, everything else falls into place. Mm, I love that. I love that you mentioned that that was downstream. And I was going to say, you know, even if, even if a ketogenic diet doesn't you know, make your metabolism go super, super high. Even if it's just normal, just think about the alternative. Somebody who's doing calorie counting, they're on diets, they're exercising and burning a bunch of calories. Their metabolisms are generally very low and they are cold and hungry. They're pissy. Um, you know, they're not very fun to be around and they and they cause the weight gain on the back end. That biggest loser study they did a few years ago proved that. And yet that yeah. diet is still listed as a better diet than a ketogenic diet. According to yeah. who the hell knows US news and world group. report It's 17 <laughs> out of 39, because it was 17 out of 39 keto is number 39 lowest on the list for health. Un I wrote a rebuttal about that because it's so absurd. Unbelievable. Um, <laughs> it's, it does. It, well, there's bias in there, like phenomenal bias, but, wow. uh, and, and, and no science. Wow. Anyway, but it's, it's, it's really cool. I mean, I, like I said, I don't think this needs to be the way. I don't think it is the way, but it's just a complete shame that it's not given as an option. option. Why did I suffer for years? And no doctor even said until one doctor did, I'll give Vivian Lowe some credit. Uh, she was phenomenal, you know, but you know, it took years to get to someone say like, oh, maybe you can actually try a ketogenic diet. Like this, that, like hearing those words and giving, yeah. giving me permission to even try this as an option. Wow. And, and, and that's so big for patients, mm -hmm. just giving it, giving it to them as an option. If they don't want to take it, then, then fine. Like, but the fact that it's, that, that, that it's shunned for silly reasons, and we can go into probably the number one reason, if you want to spend some time on, you know, high fat and heart disease, because that's also bunk. I don't know if you want to go down that rabbit hole, but I think that's one thing that turns people away from ketogenic diets is not even like the fat thing. Although there is that pun intended visceral reaction to the concept of high fat, but that, that, idea that was that good. That was good. Arteries. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> Better than the fatty. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, that's just not for the most part, not accurate. Well, let's talk uh, about that like for LDL. a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, oh, where do you even start? So first thing I'll say is that, the thing you're probably worried about LDL cholesterol is a pretty bad marker for cardiovascular risk. In fact, it's a pretty horrible marker, all things considered. And if you want data on this, you can look up a study came out recently in JAMA cardiology. Um, I think it was January 20th, 2021. And this is a pretty cool study because what they did is they looked at 28,024 women from the women's heart study, and they followed them for 21.4 years. Not only were there tens of thousands of women and you know a long follow-up period, but they looked at more markers that have ever been looked at in a study for um, trying to find a relationship between different metabolic and clinical markers and um, uh, cardi coronary heart disease. And what they found in this study was the number one clinical risk factor by far for coronary heart disease was diabetes, 
uh, you know, having diabetes increased your risk about a thousand fold of having coronary heart disease. Wow. And among the metabolic markers, the non-clinical ones was the um, metabolic condition associated with diabetes insulin resistance. So even if you were, you know, not diabetic, if you had, you know, say a marker of metabolic syndrome, uh, so if you're so not exactly in that study, but if you're insulin resistant, and we can talk about how to monitor that later, then your risk was increased, um, like the hazards ratio was 6.4. So a hazards ratio is the fold increase uh, risk. So, you know, if the hazard ratio was two, it would be twice as risky, twice mm -hmm. as likely of having coronary heart disease. So 6.4. Um, so I guess if 100 is baseline, 100% is baseline, this is a 540% increase. Wow. Let's compare that to LDL. LDL cholesterol, 38%. Wow. So plus 540%, 140% or plus 38%. Like that's the thing you're comparing. And then if you actually start to look at, you know, LDL in a little bit more depth. So LDL, um, it's carried, it's, it's, there's LDL particles, these little boats that carry around like fat and cholesterol. And there are, uh, different sizes depending on where the LDL is in its life cycle. And if LDL is big and fluffy, it's actually totally fine. Big fluffy LDL does not contribute or correlate with cardiovascular disease. It's only the small dense LDL, which is associated with insulin resistance that does. So if you actually just go then do the breakdown, which they did in this paper and look at, is it, you know, big fluffy, small dense, the small dense LDL, which is, I would say bad LDL, bad cholesterol that was associated with heart disease. The big fluffy wasn't, but guess what? If you're insulin sensitive, then you have very little of that small dense LDL anyway. Yeah. And this is, this is pretty interesting because on ketogenic diets, only about 20 to 30% of people see their LDL increase, but when it does, it's selectively the big fluffy. And I was so confident about this that <laughs> uh, I, I did a, a case report on, on someone early on in my academic career, uh, which wasn't that long ago, basically before they started a ketogenic diet, they had... Um, what's called like a lean mass hyperresponder phenotype. So they were lean and athletic. And generally, these are the people that will see the bump in LDL. Yeah. So we got a full lipid panel, like a subfractionation NMR on this person before they went keto. Um, and then uh, after they went keto, because what I thought would happen is that there'd be a big jump in the LDL, but that if we looked at the, like the LDL in depth that the, it would be all big fluffy and the L small, small LDL actually wouldn't go up at all. You can look this trial up. It was a case report. A standard lipid panel is insufficient for the care of a patient on a high fat, low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. But I'll, I'll just, I'll tell you what we found, which is in line with the predictions. The LDL um, more than tripled. It went from 95 to 321, mm. which is considered very high. What happened to these small dense LDL? It actually went down. It went down by 10%. Mm. Inflammation was good. HSCRP was low. Insulin levels were low, um, suggesting good insulin sensitivity. Um, and I've seen many more data now from many more uh, patients seeing the same thing. It's like when your LDL goes up, it actually is generally associated with an improvement in overall cardiovascular risk. Um, LDL also, and this is a strong statement, but there's no data showing LDL can alone cause heart disease. Yep. I've seen some extreme cases. I saw one case of someone with LDL of above 700 for multiple years who had no progression of atherosclerosis. Wow. And I'm not saying be okay with numbers of 700 milligrams per deciliter by any means. Like don't, don't, please don't interpret that. But I'm just saying, you know, the things we've been told to fear, I think it's more complicated than that. And, um, and then, Stronger risk factors for cardiovascular disease are things like HDL, which go up on a ketogenic diet. So that's good. You want high HDL. And triglycerides, fat in the blood, go down on a ketogenic diet. They actually go down really low. So I'll just tell you, you know, I'm eating 350 grams of fat a day, which is like what? A week's worth of fat in a day, according to what I'm supposed to be eating. Um, and low triglycerides, so low blood flat, you, the, you know, recommendations say below 150. I run 40. 40 milligrams per deciliter, which is, uh, I'll pat myself on the back for that one. That's, that's great. Story, but I see that all the time. That's great. You know, fat, 
does not, yeah, does fat does not increase fat in your blood if you're restricting carbohydrates. The carbohydrates that are being turned into fat, especially fructose, especially if you're insulin resistant, that are leading to inc- increased triglycerides. And so um, it's interesting because then what you really need to do is look at everything in the composite. And what we find is, is if you look at someone with high HDL, which suggests good metabolic health and low triglycerides, LDL really doesn't appear to impact risk almost at all. Um, and there's no evidence. And again, this is a strong statement, but I would challenge you or your doctor to find the paper I'm going to ask you to find because I don't think it exists. Evidence that lowering LDL improves cardiovascular outcomes in someone who has um, low triglycerides and high HDL. So if you have high HDL, low triglycerides, does LDL matter? I, I'm not sure, but we don't actually have any evidence to say that it does or to say that something like a statin improves cardiovascular outcomes. On a population level, the statins you know, moderately reduce risk. And I would say moderately um, because it's not that big an effect. But that's looking at, again, the 88% of metabolically unhealthy people who are insulin resistant. So their LDL is going to be turning into small, dense LDL. And their LDL is going to be high for reasons that are completely different than LDL going up on a low-carb uh, ketogenic diet. And if you want more details on that, I suggest looking up Dave Feldman's yep. lipid energy model in his Stanford lecture, um, which is really cool. In fact, there's this one like mic drop moment in it. Um, because he does a lot of cool self experiments and he shows a graph about how he dropped his LDL by 213 milligrams per deciliter in one week without medications. Yep. That's huge. Yep. Um, you know, 213 mil, uh, like he went from around 300, I think it was 297 to like well below a hundred. And, you know, if you were just looking at that metabolic marker and you were going by conventional guidelines, like that's a healthy, you know, drop. I don't believe it is, but, but then you ask, oh, how did he do it? You know how he did it? He did it by having what is objectively an unhealthy diet, eating only white wonder bread and processed meat. <laughs> and it has to do with the fact that, you know, well, look up his lipid energy model if you get into that, but just like, think about that for a minute. Eating something that is known to be unhealthy creates a change in LDL that probably a cardiologist would say is, is healthy. So, you know, going by the concept that drop LDL at all costs, you know, go eat your wonder bread and process meat. Yep. Wow. That would be the prescription. So wow. that's amazing. We love Dave Feldman and we're so grateful for him and his work because, you know, he came at it as a scientist. He wasn't in the nutrition field and he could see the system as a software engineer. And it looked like, it looked like emails. It looked like, you know, software design. And all he did is just kind of look at that in a different way. And it completely flipped the paradigm. And it makes perfect sense how you can go through some of his protocols. If you're nervous about going to the doctor and being put on a statin, go find his protocol because you will be able to look temporarily lower your LDL cholesterol very, very quickly within just like a few days. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, three days. Yeah. It's, I, I can do it on demand now, drop my LDL 250 if I want, yeah. like easily. Wow. And, um, and you know, so Dave is, it's so weird because it's like, you want to believe that credentials really matter and there's something to them. Um, you know, uh, but, but, you know, Dave's a software engineer, he's on MD PhD. And now I know so many doctors, including myself as a PhD who go to Dave and you're like, Dave, can you help me understand this? Like, let me think yeah. about this differently because we need to think about things differently. And just as a sidebar, you know, I, me and Dave, I think we're working more and more closely together. I'm actually having him come speak to some Harvard med students this Saturday. Oh, cool. And uh, going to a grand round lecture that he's giving the following week. And we're talking now about, you know, well, I won't get the details, but like, you know, he's starting to collect some data and start to write up these papers. So I'm probably going to be in on that. He's phenomenal. Mm. If you want to understand insulin resistance, go to Ben Bickman. If you want to understand lipid metabolism, don't go to your cardiologist. I'm sorry, uh, cardiologist, but go to, uh, you know, go to, Go to Dave Feldman. Yeah, hundred um, uh, percent. So yeah, 100%. if you do want a good cardiologist, Brett Sure at Diet Doctor is pretty good too. He's amazing. Yeah, it was super fun to talk to him a few weeks ago. He's a great guy. Followed his work yeah, for a long time. But, wow. Well, okay. Yeah. Well, this this is an absolute clinic <laughs> that you're putting on. I'm so grateful that you were able to kind of go down that rabbit hole and explain the fat thing. You could have 
with your base of knowledge and your understanding of this stuff, you could have written a textbook, but you chose to write a cookbook. Can you tell us a little bit about why <laughs> it was important for you to write something that was more practical and, and you know, hopefully something that can uh, touch more people? Yeah. Well, um, I, you know, I've written a, a textbook parts. It's pretty dry. And I've also written lots of papers and, and lots of blogs. And the thing I started to notice, because I just wanted to get engaged with people at every level, is I can have more direct impact by advocating uh, like myself via a platform that's a little bit unfiltered, not peer review. It's not as prestigious for me in terms of my career. Like, you know, I should be publishing peer review papers, which I am. Uh, had one two days ago, had one you know, a month before that. So I'm, I'm working on that stuff. But, you know, people, lay people aren't going to be able to understand that. Um, I mean, some of them can try. Some of, you know, maybe they can. Maybe I'm not giving people enough credit. But for the most part, you're not going to want to slog through a paper about all these different mechanisms, CYPA, MMP9, Pathways, XYZ. You just want the, you know, practical bits and logical things like, you know, Dave's boat in the, boats in the bloodstream analogy. So while in parallel with doing my PhD, I was just trying all these different avenues to engage with people. And then um, I ended up making a, a partnership with an amazing, amazing uh, woman, Martina Slaryova. So um, she's actually a cookbook author. She lives in, 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 in London and I think it's London. Um, and, and what ended up happening, the way this transpired is I was working out at Oxford on my PhD. I got friendly with uh, one of the other people listed on the book, Rohan Kashid, who was the head chef at the one of the nicest restaurants in Oxford, the Quad Restaurant, mm. um, and actually started working with him on his nutrition. He dropped weight like crazy. And this is a guy who was pre-diabetic and obese and thought, you know, that diabetes and Alzheimer's were just, you know, part of, you know, the, the lifespan. Um, and you know, also a guy who's in the kitchen 16 hours a day. So he's surrounded by food. It's anybody who's going to have a hard time with a diet. It is this guy who also is supposed to like be tasting things. And we go, we have him go keto, um, address his metabolic health and he drops weight like crazy, becomes pretty passionate about it. And then together we host this dining event for the community that's keto focused. And it just goes super well. We had 60 people, a ton of food. And not one scrap was left. I know that wow. because I really hate food waste. And I say, I said to the, the, you know, if anything is left, like a d piece of duck skin, like put it in a bag for me, I will eat it. <laughs> and they're like, and it got, you know, like, well, sorry, Nick, we actually don't have any leftovers for you. Like there's nothing left. So people loved it. But one of the people that came was Martina. And so then we got to talking while we were there. And then afterwards about what if we combined forces, you know, I love to cook. Uh, but I am not a, a chef. Um, I do have a lot of scientific expertise. What if we, you know, made a team and, and together, you know, I brought the science, you, you bring the resources in terms of publishers and, and, you know, making things look pretty, putting together proper recipes. And we go back and forth and we iterate in this, you know, team-based manner on a manuscript. Um, and so what we ended up doing is doing just that. So the past couple of years we've been working on it. I never would have imagined how much work a cookbook would be, but um, yeah, it's, it's coming out now and I'm super excited about it. We, we have a, it's Mediterranean keto themed and that was very intentionally chosen for a couple of reasons. One, you know, if, if people are on the fence about, you know, the concept of eating, you know, meats and cheeses, like, and, and, and what they probably conceive of is, is, is keto without lots of veg. Like that is not what keto means by any means. It just means what your macronutrients are. So you can make that anything you want. And since Mediterranean is so popular and there's decent you know, evidence behind it, we thought we'd just blend them. This is a science-based Mediterranean ketogenic cookbook that you know doesn't just involve me and Martina, but we had some of my colleagues come and contribute. So various doctors and scientists from around the world, Stanford, Oxford, Harvard. And um, it's just our attempt at creating something that's a little bit fun and accessible that teaches people about nutrition in an accessible way and engages them through things like fun facts. So hopefully it's just a springboard. I want to do more projects like this, but for me, it was just one more experiment, one more avenue of connecting with people. And I just, I, um, you know, I hope anybody that listens to this feels comfortable reaching out to me on somewhere like Twitter, um, which is where I'm most active because that's what I'm passionate about now. I'm making, you know, bringing information forward, however that be, and be that peer-reviewed studies, running clinical trials, YouTube, Twitter, cookbooks, 
what have you. I'm just, I'm really excited. I'm early in my career. I'm coming to this with the energy I had marathon training. I'm redirecting all of that to this and saying, I have to just try it all and see what sticks, see what, you know, really engages me. And I, you know, I just enjoy every minute of it. It's It's like one of those things you'll never work a day in your life if you love what you do. And I get up at like, you know, four or 5 a.m. I'm reading papers and I'm working usually 14 hours a day. And I sound like a workaholic and at some level I am, but like, it's, it's just an absolute pleasure. And, and I, I, I just love it all. That's and amazing. This cookbook was just one more thing. And I also want to plug, I'm not, you know, people are worried about conflicts of interest and stuff. All the money that I get from this cookbook, I'm uh, committed to um, directing towards research uh, and education. So things wow. like, you know, funding, Sean Baker's running a carnivore trial. Um, Dr. Sean Baker, uh, Chris Palmer at Harvard's running, you know, a mental health trial is trying to fundraise for that. Like anybody that buys this book is going to be supporting things uh, like that or other education uh, practices in, in some capacity. So mm. I'm not going to go pocket this uh, just for the heck of it. Although, you know, I could use it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, things that's... will come down the line, but this is a project that I, you know, I, I just, I hope it can help people. And, um, and also for people that are already kind of there, I don't know how many people are listening or like already kind of keto and they know what they're doing, but this is the kind of, I would call it a Trojan horse for keto. This is the new Mediterranean diet cookbook in big font. And then it's like a keto friendly book. It just happens to be, you know, less than 10% of carbs, no processed food, no required sweeteners, no gluten or grains or any of that. And so it's the kind of thing that I also created as a resource or we created as a resource for people to bring to loved ones who are keto skeptics or people who are having a little bit of a conflict with their doctors. Because I deal with a lot of people who are like, oh, don't go keto. Uh, it's going to give you a heart attack. Why don't you go Mediterranean instead? And so this is kind of a compromise of sorts. Uh, at least that's what I intended to be. Wow. So I'm excited about that project as well yeah. as a, a lot of other things. And one last thing, actually, it's not going to be the last thing. I'm sure I'm going to continue to ramble, <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, if you want, proof in the pudding about the kind of thought that went into this book. Um, we'll link uh, hopefully the try the, the study that just came out. Uh, it was a precision nutrition for Alzheimer's prevention, uh, paper in nutrients to kind of give you a sense of the thought that went behind these recipes. So this is a Mediterranean keto kind of paper that was just published in the peer reviewed scientific literature a couple of days ago. And you can see about like how I think about nutrition. By looking at that paper, I think you can get a glimpse um, that, you know, this is not frou-frou. Mm. Read that paper, you know, try to read that paper and then tell me if this is food is medicine, it's frou-frou. Mm. Interesting. Uh, and if you still think it is, then fine. <laughs> well, I mean, I just think, I mean, looking through it, the book is beautiful. The recipes look amazing. Screw it if it's keto or, keto or not. Like, it looks super, super good. Anybody would love eating those meals. They're, they don't look very complicated, but they look super tasty, you know, well-seasoned. I saw that on your video, the foods that you make. And, man, they, just, they, <laughs> they look really good, really delicious. <laughs> so I'll definitely be looking forward to that, and I will definitely be ordering my copy. That's super cool to know that the money will be going towards helping uh, those – you know, the great research papers out there that can help, you know, continue to move this ball forward. This has been, this has been such a great conversation. Um, we've gone so many different places. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think back on, on you and your life and, and face down in your bed and, and you say hopeless and that's, that's a deep feeling hopelessness. And I, I think I'd gone through some hard times in my life, but I don't know that I've ever been hopeless. And so I, I would love to have you, you know, one simple tip you would give to somebody out there who's listening that feels hopeless. They feel like they're not getting better. What What is one simple thing you would like to let them know? Wow. That's, that's one simple thing. That's a hard one. I would say your health is a journey. The foundation of that journey is, you know, good nutrition and metabolism, but this is a personal journey for you. You don't have to do what I did. You don't have to do keto. I think that might be a good option to play with, but this is your journey. And so the number one thing anybody can do, I think the, the, the big lever to pull, if you're not pulling out already is nutrition. I genuinely believe that. And I think there are a lot of great you know, resources that I can, you know, direct people to things like diet doctor, um, society of metabolic health practitioners, various clubhouse groups, but, but, um, 
this is your journey. And what I think is really important for people to realize is that you have a responsibility to yourself to take your health into your own hands. You know, health needs to be a priority. I know people are busy. Health still needs to be a priority because if you have health, you have nothing. And if you're hopeless and you don't have health, like, you know what I'm talking about. And so how do you pursue that journey? And really the only way to pursue it and make, make it like lifelong growth is to be observant. Really try to think about how things make you feel. Um, you know, like if you eat this or you don't eat this, do you feel better? And always tweak things. Play the scientist in your own life. You know, for me, it's like, oh, you know, if I eat this cheese at this time of day, like, how do I feel the next day? Like, really think about that. Even just start a reflection journal um, about how you feel when you eat certain things or your thoughts and, and your progress. And that can extend to other aspects of, of lifestyle, sleep, exercise, and um, always try to question things like a scientist, refute your null hypothesis, play with things, tweak things. And what I find is that you know, not only do people improve, but it's not that kind of improvement where you're like, okay, I need to lose 50 pounds. So I'm going to, you know, restrict. And then I lost 50 pounds and then I'm happy. It's not like that. There isn't per se an end point in mind. If you can shift your mindset to the point where you realize nutrition and metabolic health, they're not chores. They're an amazing opportunity to be continually improving throughout your life doing experiments on yourself every day. And, you know, you're not going to stay stagnant. You're either going to be getting less healthy or more healthy. So make it the more healthy option. Always be improving. And, you know, think about nutrition as, as a journey, a fun journey, an opportunity. You know, I, I now say, you know, I used to be a foodie um, before the colitis and I just loved the taste of food. Like everybody, I had a gustatory pleasure from food and then I had colitis. And then there was a point I just, I feared food. I would, if I could choose the option to never eat again, I would have taken that option in a heartbeat. And now I'm at a new place weirdly where food is not only a gustatory pleasure, but it's an intellectual one and a personal one uh, as well, an experimental one, because I realized like, wow, this is a tool that I get to use every day to improve myself, whether that makes my brain function better, whether that means like, oh, I can manipulate my LDL, my triglycerides, my cholesterol on demand and learn about my body. It's so cool. And, and once you can achieve thinking about health in that capacity, whatever your level of education, and I do think getting informed is important, that's going to set you up to success. Whether you're a vegan or you're a carnivore, it doesn't really matter. You just need to, to, to be aware. I do like to dig into the science and not everybody, you know, is for that. I think it's important to get educated, become informed. But my one piece of advice was your health journey is a journey and it's a fun journey. Get engaged with it and be observant um, because that's how you make progress that is continual. Wow. That is so beautifully said. I so much appreciate that. Where would you like people to go to connect with you and, um, you know, find your work? Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm right now most active on Twitter at Nick Norwitz. And um, in terms of my story, I did have a friend, uh, Florence Curtis, did a beautiful job basically putting my story into a, a five minute documentary on my YouTube. So that that's be nice if you, you viewed that, shared that just because. Um, sometimes I'm not super articulate about my own story. We started on it and you can see I barely, very quickly went into my comfort zone with a little bit of the science. So uh, I had that produced in to, to share my story because I do think it, it's meaningful and can impact people. And um, so if, if you, you know, have someone in your life who say hopeless, it's the kind of thing that just might make them think. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, I'm active on a lot of different social media. Clubhouse, I love to talk to people. People have Clubhouse. That's where I do a lot of keto rooms. And if people are interested in getting into keto, I really recommend getting the Clubhouse app and joining one of those communities because the hardest thing about keto is not the diet. It's actually a really pleasant diet if you do it right and you know help you know troubleshoot it, the, the speed bumps. But it's just the social aspect. And having a community is so, so important. Totally agree. That's the reason it's hard to adhere to. So, you wow. know, find a community. Um, but yeah, Twitter at Nick Norwitz and um, if people check out that video and then um, I do do support the book if you can, if you think it'll be helpful for you. 
uh, and we would really appreciate, I'm not necessarily the main PR person, but I do know that Amazon reviews make a difference. So if you yes. get it and, uh, and, and would be generous enough to write a little review on Amazon, I think me and my co-authors would really appreciate it because it would you know, help us set up more projects like this. And we do have some other projects in mind uh, as I go forward into my you know, medical and, 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 uh, and, and more into my research career as well. So you would enable that, but um, yeah, anything you can do to just spread metabolic health with your friends and loved ones and around you. I'd appreciate that. That's great. And and the book and, you know, a hub also for you can be found at newmediketo.com. Is that correct? Uh, we're getting the website up and going. It's a little bit slow moving right now. But uh, yeah, if you want to check out the book's concept, we'll link. So that's just like it lays out the concept of the book. I really want to have like success stories there and lectures and a bunch of different other things. Wow. Um, so we'll, we'll get to that hopefully in time. But uh, I'm I'm not a tech guy. Uh, so my my my. Um, partner Martina and her partner, uh, her life partner, Nikos, are, are doing the heavy lifting on that. So I like I write it in Word and send it over to them and they do all the, the hard work. So gotcha. right now they're pretty inundated. So wow. uh, it's it's early stages, but we'll get it rolling over the next several months. Cool. So. We'll look forward to that. Dr. Nicholas Norwitz. Wow. What an amazing conversation, amazing story, a journey. Um, I, I'm so grateful for you and for sharing that with our listeners and also telling us what you've learned and giving really easy um, and applicable things that people can do and and helping people understand that there can be hope where there's where there's hopelessness, we can restore hope and health. And so thank you so very much for everything that you do and thank you for coming onto our show today. We just really appreciate you and all your work and we are looking forward to much more of it in the future. Thank you so much. Um... Thank you so much for having me. It was really a pleasure. And, and if you end up talking with uh, Director McGilvery, uh, send him my best wishes. I don't <laughs> do think I, he probably wouldn't remember me. We talked once. In fact, um, yeah, no. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm honored to be here. That's awesome. Um, thank you for letting me share. Absolutely. It's an absolute honor to host you. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio. 